Good morning. I'm LaShondra Shaw, PIO for the City of Austin, and I'm the moderator for today's media availability. Spanish interpretation is available on ATXN3. To start, Dr. Desmar Walks, Austin Travis County Health Authority, will first say a few words, followed by Interim Austin Public Health Director, Adrian Stirrup, then Janet Pachette, Austin Public Health Chief Epidemiologist, followed by Cassandra De Leon, APH Chief Administrative Officer for Disease Prevention and Health Promotion Division. We will then open it up to our pool reporter who will ask questions on behalf of the media. Dr. Walks, over to you. Good morning, Austin. Um, we've had a very eventful week in having crossed the threshold of over a thousand deaths. Um, and we continue to mourn the loss of loved ones and neighbors um, that have succumbed to this virus, COVID-19, which has been in our community for far too long. But we're also looking forward to um, nearly reaching that mark of 70% on uh, those who are fully vaccinated and eligible for vaccinations. We've worked hard as a community to wear masks and stop the spread of COVID-19 um, and keep our businesses and our schools opened as much as we can by working together. And we hope that uh, the decline in cases that we're seeing will continue, the decline in our positivity rate will continue, and that we can get out and enjoy this lovely fall. And we ask that everybody continue their efforts to vaccinate themselves to protect themselves against COVID-19. And also looking forward to flu season coming that we will do the same with flu and get our flu vaccinations. And with that, I'll turn it over to Director Stirrup. Thank you, Dr. Walks. Good morning, Austin. As Dr. Walk said, we are continuing to be here to make sure that our community has full access to vaccines. We are continuing to have our stand up locations at Southeast Library in Little Walnut Creek. We're also supporting the operations at the Anna Lark Center, and we can be in any home or at any special event within our community. We're in Del Valley. We're, we're going places to make sure that people can access vaccine. We are very close to the 70% mark of having our community fully vaccinated. But we do understand that there will be pockets in our community of places and spaces where we need to continue to do that work. And we will continue to do that work to make sure that there is equitable vaccine coverage for our community. And with that, I pass it over to Janet Pichette. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Box mentioned, we hit a grim milestone this week with having over a thousand deaths uh, reported from COVID-19. Uh, this represents a tenfold increase in the number of deaths that we've seen between June and August of this year. Uh, you know, based on the current number of deaths, uh, you know, it's we want we want, obviously want to make that change and, and see those numbers come down. Uh, but based on that information, we in Austin Travis County stand to have COVID once again uh, become one of the leading causes of death in our community uh, it, based on the current projections. And, you know, we hope to hope that to turn that around and, and not make that the case. One other item I'd like to bring up is, you know, we are currently monitoring cases and clusters. We are seeing uh, decreasing numbers and we want that trend to continue. Uh, with schools being in session, we're monitoring clusters closely. Uh, you are hearing probably of some places where schools have closed or school districts have closed because they just haven't had enough staff or substitutes to maintain education in those school districts. Um, the other thing too, uh, we're coming off of a busy Labor Day weekend and we'll begin closely monitoring the cases that may have, uh, they may pop up as a result of busy holiday weekend activities. So um, that that work continues uh, at Austin Public Health. And with that, I'll turn it over to Cassie DeLeon. 
Thank you, Janet. And um, just want to give some more insight into how we are continuing to plan for operations as the response evolves. Um, as our director, Adrian Sturrup, talked about, is we are able to be in any uh, spaces uh, making a vaccine as accessible as possible. Uh, there has been new movement um, regarding uh, uh, information around third doses and around the potential of the um, FDA uh, authorizing booster vaccines. We, Austin Public Health, and the broader provider community is prepared to um, increase and enhance operations to provide boosters should, when, and if they become uh, recommended by the FDA and the Centers for Disease Control. Um, it, some of the plans include that we are uh, launching um, looking to launch additional operational locations and then also adding capacity for staff, uh, making enhancements into our um, our uh, online system and also adding folks into our call center so that there are no barriers to anyone who are seeking vaccine right now. And as boosters come online, that there'd be no barriers for those to receive vaccine then. A huge difference between this time of uh, this part of the response and response uh, back in January is that there are many, many outlets that are providing vaccines, many providers, and there is lots of vaccine available. And so with that, we really focus um, our efforts to continue to double down and work to get the um, 350,000 individuals that are in our community that still are not fully vaccinated. So even with boosters and with third doses being a part of the operational planning, um, we still have to make sure that the those that are unvaccinated and those that are not fully vaccinated continue to be the priority. And with that, I'll open us up for questions. Thank you, Cassandra. Now we will move on to our full reporter, Michael Clark Madison, who is with the Austin Chronicle. Michael. Thank you and uh, good morning, ladies. Uh, yes, I'm Mike Clark Madison from the Austin Chronicle. Um, I'll go ahead and start with our question. Uh, the uh, COVID plans that are required of the events that are happening this fall uh, were recently strengthened a little bit by uh, you all in the Austin Center for Events. Do you think these safety guidelines are going to be sufficient to help uh, avoid some new outbreaks to that would overload the hospital system, sort of building on what Dr. Chet was talking about with the Labor Day outbreaks. Do you do you think that we're going to be seeing more issues with events like ACL? And do you think the plans that are being uh, prepared by these event organizers are um, going to be sufficient? We are, as you know, um, part of the public health response and, and public health and in medicine, we try to be cognizant of all of the risk and mitigate for those risks. But unfortunately, we um, sometimes will have things happen that we're not um, expecting. But for as much as we can, we are planning for and mitigating for risks that are um, apparent to us and from our historical knowledge of how this Delta variant of the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, behaves. And so uh, the mitigation efforts that we've included in the plan that is currently being used by our event section are things that we put in place to help protect those who attend events from um, the uh, spread of this virus as much as we can. Um, so vaccinations continue to be the primary way that people are protected from getting infected by SARS-CoV-2 and mask decrease the spread as well as social distancing. So those are our main points. Um, so to be clear that those are the things that have worked in the past and we anticipate those to be the things that will protect going forward. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Walks. Um, next question is from KXAN. What's being done locally to meet and enforce the requirements outlined yesterday by President Biden? Uh, 
That is a very good question. Um, considering that the recommendations or the plan from the White House was released less than 24 hours ago, um, we will need time to review and to get more information to assess what the impacts will be here locally. Um, generally, as a public health official, I'm in support of anything that helps our community um, increase its vaccination rate. And I'll just layer on that we, Austin Public Health, as uh, we mentioned earlier, we're available to provide support for those businesses that want to get a heads up uh, ahead of this whole, um, these men, these recommendations uh, and provide vaccine. Um, so if, if any business is interested in needing that support, we're available to provide that. All right, thank you, Cassie and Director Stirrup. Uh, the next question is from Co-op Radio. If the Delta variant can be carried and spread by the vaccinated, is a recent negative test a more important criteria for gatherings than proof of vaccination? So it is true that there is a symptomatic transmission that occurs in people who are vaccinated, but uh, vaccine breakthrough cases happen less than 1% of the time. So vaccinations still are an important Part and the most important part of protecting ourselves uh, from becoming sick due to SARS-CoV-2 infections, including the Delta variant and any other variants that may be in circulation. Um, a test, however, is another layer of protection and a negative test in, in the face of somebody who's vaccinated just gives that much more assurance that there's less risk of becoming infected when you go to an, an environment where there are several people that you're not related to, not living with, that are in attendance as well. And I will add, I, I'll add that, uh, you know, other layers of protection that we've been, uh, you know, trying to educate folks on since the very beginning of this pandemic include making sure you're masking, making sure you're social distancing when, uh, when you can, uh, you know, avoiding touching your hand or your face uh, with your hands, uh, washing your hands frequently. And most importantly, if you're sick, you need to stay home and, and not expose other individuals. It requires all those layers of protection. All right, thank you, Dr. Shep, Dr. Walks. It's a great reminder. Next question is from the Austin American Statesman. Austin and Travis County are close to reaching the minimum threshold for herd immunity. Will reaching the minimum threshold have as much of an impact as previously believed where further disease spread would be unlikely? Why or why not? We believe that that milestone of 70% is important. There have been numerous studies around the world um, regarding herd immunity and showing that at that 70% mark, we are um, able to protect our um, society and community from um, spread at the rate that we've seen in, in some of the surges that we've been experiencing. However, it's still important for us to move forward to vaccinate those who currently are not eligible for vaccination, uh, those that are under the age of 12. It's still important for us to get those who are unvaccinated, who are eligible, um, vaccinated to protect them from disease. And it's still important for us to look around us to our neighbors in neighboring counties and get them vaccinated as well, because they do use our uh, hospital system for care. And, and so if they're um, not vaccinated, that impacts our hospital systems as well. So although that milestone is within reach, we still need to redouble our efforts to get people vaccinated and protected from COVID-19. And in the meantime, use that layered uh, protection method that was just outlined um, by uh, Janet Prashat, because that is really an important way that we've gotten through previous surges before vaccinations were available. And that's that was the way that we kept this virus from spreading. And that was the way we protected our hospital system. 
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Walks. This next question is from CBS Austin. It does relate to a neighboring county. With the Williamson County attorney looking to overturn mask mandates, how does that affect organizations in the city of Austin, but in Williamson County? And how does that affect school districts that cross the Williamson-Travis County line? It's going to be uh, something that our legal team will review and um, advise us on. Um, the, the issuing of a mandate does not preclude an individual from making a personal choice to protect themselves from a communicable disease, SARS-CoV-2, by wearing a mask. And it doesn't preclude, of course, um, that individual looking for extra protection by, if they're not vaccinated, going out and getting vaccinated. Okay, thank you for that answer. The next question is from KUT. Austin Public Health reported 23 new COVID-19 deaths on Wednesday, which appears to be the most reported in one day since the start of the pandemic. Is this high number evidence that the Delta variant is causing more severe disease, or is it a reflection of how this surge in cases is affecting the local healthcare system's ability to treat people? We have received enormous amounts of data here at APH, and I'll um, have Janet Pichette talk more about that issue. Um, but yes, the Delta variant is, uh, per, is causing a lot more severe disease um, and, and it is impacting our hospital systems. However, the care that's being provided in our hospital systems is still the standard of care that we have come to know and, and expect. The number of deaths that were recorded on any given day, however, um, do not always reflect the deaths that have happened within a 24 hour period. And I'll, I'll pass it on to you, Janet, to talk more about that. Sure, so um, one of the challenges we have at Austin Public Health in processing death information is that we obtain it from multiple sources. Uh, we may get a cause or we may get a death notification from the hospital at time of death in a death summary that's reported to us. We may uh, get it from a funeral home reports who reports uh, uh, deaths into our Office of Vital Records, and we may also get uh, deaths reporting in, reported into us uh, from our, our Travis County Medical Examiner. So it does take some time to reconcile and capture that information, uh, reconcile it so that we can avoid any duplication in the numbers and report out what we have. Uh, and so, uh, it, you know, they may trickle in. What we're finding, uh, as we are seeing in other peaks, uh, is that at, usually there's a lag in about three weeks uh, from when deaths start uh, rolling into our office and, and being reported. So after a peak, uh, when people are hospitalized uh, with serious illness and succumb to death, uh, we usually start seeing that those cases come into the office about three weeks following that peak. Um, but it, it does take a, a good amount of effort to try to reconcile that information here uh, at the health department. All right, thank you for that, that, that context. Next question is from Community Impact. Although daily hospital admissions have dropped steadily this month, ICUs have remained just as packed. What does this signify? And do you think declining admissions forecast an improvement in ICU capacity? Unfortunately, the natural progression of this disease caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus is such that it will take some time, weeks to months to clear out um, and move people out of ICU onto um, step down units and eventual discharge from the hospital. And so what we're seeing right now is there are several people that are going to require more time um, to get better. And so that is just the nature of this uh, disease that we're dealing with. 
It is encouraging that our hospitalization numbers are declining, and that is in large part due to the behavioral changes that we've seen in our community. People masking, social distancing, staying home when they're sick, those who test positive, um, going to seek care of a healthcare provider, seeing if they're eligible for monoclonal antibody therapy so that they can avoid hospitalization, and, and those who have been vaccinated continuing to go and protect themselves with vaccines. So it's a compilation of all of those things that have gone into the decline in numbers that we're seeing, and we want that to continue. All right, thank you, Dr. Walks. The next question is from Fox 7 News. Have we seen a spike in cases related to school athletics participation? Um, you know, we are seeing spiking cases in school districts in general. And, uh, you know, I think part of the challenge with this overwhelming number of new cases that are, we're seeing in the school districts is that uh, there has been limited ability for some of these school partners to complete com uh, contact tracing to the level that they need to identify where the actual so source of uh, disease transmission risk began. Uh, you know, we're trying to support the schools. We are seeing uh, clusters occurring uh, related to athletics and to the classroom and a number of other areas. Uh, but, um, you know, again, we're trying to support and provide recommendations where available. All right, thank you, Dr. Pichet. Uh, the next question is from Telemundo, asking for an update on efforts to reach communities of color and vaccination efforts. Has there been a substantial increase in the number of black and brown people who are getting this that, the vaccine? And could the city have done a better job at outreach from the beginning? I can start. Um, I will say that what we have seen in, um, you know, the since the end of August to current that the largest uh, percent change within our African American and Hispanic population that that's where we're seeing the largest change and increase in vaccine. Um, those populations, however, are still under um, vaccinated. They are not um, reaching those 70% uh, first dose and second dose. For example, our African American population is probably the most significantly uh, disproportionately represented here. Um, they still are lagging and they're um, fully vaccinated at only 32%. And so there's definite efforts that need to continue to be made to not just offer vaccine, but also to really meet people where they're at, uh, provide them with information about um, what the vaccine uh, can do for them, how important it is for to get vaccinated, the safety of the vaccine, and really finding out what are the reasons for their hesitancy of not getting it. Um, we continue to make efforts to make sure that the vaccine is offered in places that are um, comfortable and safe and um, that the community that is being served is also being served by individuals that are representative of, of the community as well. So really working to try to make sure that we're addressing all of those needs, but also trying to really focus in on what is the cause of that hesitancy? Um, how can we be better, better meeting their needs? We know also as a community um, provider, uh, also public health has had to evolve our response quite a bit. And early on, there were efforts to make sure that all the population within Travis County was getting access to vaccine, uh, noting that there was very limited access, uh, very limited capacity because we had such a limited amount of vaccine available. Um, but we really worked to try to improve those efforts to make sure that there's a significant supply and that there's significant access points for all, everyone in the community and then particularly doing focused outreach in communities of color. Okay, thank you for that answer. Uh, our next question is from KXA. And again, what can you tell us about the Mu variant? And are you concerned about the announcement that it was found in Dallas County? So I'll take that. Uh, you know, the Mu variant is a variant uh, 
that's been listed by the Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization as a variant of interest. This means that there's not uh, a lot of strong evidence for some of its ability to be transmissible and that, that they're continuing to study its ability from a disease transmission risk standpoint, um, whether it's a very, you know, the severity of it and what, how effective it is uh, against a uh, vaccine and other monoclonal antibody therapies. Uh, am I surprised that it's in the, uh, in, the, in Texas? Uh, I'm not surprised, you know, again, as with any disease, uh, when you have globalization of travel and people traveling in from other countries, there is a high potential for uh, them to bring a variation of the disease into our communities. And so, um, you know, that's one reason we as epidemiologists continue to monitor and surveil what types of strains are circulating out in the community. Um, Again, it's listed as a variant of interest, not a variant of concern where there's more evidence about disease transmission risks and severity of illness. Um, what's most important at this point is that uh, Delta seems to be uh, the predominant variant strain that's circulating uh, currently in the United States and in Texas, and it's keeping mu at bay. So, you know, one way we can get around from mu taking hold in our community is to making sure that we are getting vaccinated and using those layers of protection to protect ourselves, and that is masking and those types of things. Uh, again, uh, you know, this is a the way we keep uh, very variant disease from becoming predominant in our community is making sure that we're preventing disease transmission risks in general and vaccination is the best way to do it. I just wanted to add on to that. Delta is 99% of what we're seeing in our cases here in Texas and around the country. Vaccination, vaccination, vaccination. That's how we're going to eliminate the spread of Delta and prevent the emergence of any variants um, in our society. So it's really important that we continue our efforts to vaccinate our community and continue to wear masks and social distance and stay home when we're sick. All right, thank you, Dr. Spichetta and Waltz. Uh, the next question is from Co-op Radio. According to Deutsche Welle, the German news network, Cuba has not only developed its own vaccine, but is now administering it to children as young as two. Uh, what can you tell us about this and I suppose about vaccination plans for children? We in this country uh, pride ourselves on our ability to um, address safety concerns for our population. Um, we look to the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, to provide us with that comfort level and that um, assurance of safety. And they are currently working on and um, advising and providing guidance on vaccinations, including vaccinations for children under the age of 12 for uh, protection against COVID-19. Um, so we know that when they have uh, full um, evaluation of the current COVID vaccines that are available and assure themselves that it is safe for us to give to our children, that they will give us the guidance that we need to go forward. And that's what we're waiting on. All right, the next question is from the Austin American Statesman. As fall quickly approaches, what concerns does Dr. Walks have about the state of the pandemic paired with a likely higher infection rate of the flu because of a decrease in mask wearing and social distancing? Last year, we enjoyed a negligible impact of influenza in our community because of what we were doing to prevent um, the transmission of and spread of uh, COVID-19 in our community. As I said earlier, that 
that was the, the things that we use, the non-pharmaceutical measures of masking, social distancing, hand washing, staying home when sick, those were the only things that we had before the um, introduction of vaccine um, to prevent the spread of this disease. And this disease, COVID-19, is, is caused by aerosolized uh, droplets that uh, travel through the air between people. And masking prevents the introduction of those uh, infected droplets into our systems. That same thing is true of the flu. So in order for us to prevent the spread of COVID-19, um, we've introduced and continue to use masking and social distancing and hand washing and staying home when sick to keep ourselves safe from spread of COVID-19. And those things will continue um, throughout the, the year um, in, in varying amounts uh, in various situations but continue to be the way that will prevent the flu. Along with that, we now have vaccine for not only the flu, but COVID-19. So I would encourage those who have not been vaccinated for COVID-19 to go and do so. Protect yourselves by becoming vaccinated. It's safe. Um, there are over 200 million Americans who now are fully vaccinated, and we need to continue the push to get the rest of our our community vaccinated here at home. Uh, when you go to get that vaccine for COVID-19, get your flu shot. Um, if we can marry that, um, that approach that we've used for COVID-19 with our flu um, season that's approaching, we can get through this uh, next couple of months of fall um, not by being sick, by being out there, enjoying the weather and our family and loved ones. Okay, the next question is from CBS Austin. Is a pH ready to go with the booster rollout on September 20th if it's permitted by the FDA and will it be affected by the availability of only one of the vaccines being approved for boosters? I'll jump in. Uh, APH is definitely um, nimble and able to uh, stand up operations to meet community needs. Um, we, with the announcement of the third dose uh, recommendations, we were able to, uh, within uh, just a few days, um, prepare operations and started to implement that. Um, for boosters, we are looking to see what our capacity needs are and are adding additional staffing. Um, and locations to be able to anticipate um, needing to provide boosters in um, our current clinics. Um, one thing to note with Pfizer being the anticipated booster vaccine that will be recommended, Austin Public Health is a Pfizer provider and we currently offer Pfizer in all of our clinics along with the Moderna vaccine. And so definitely we are prepared and as of 920, which whatever occurs regarding the um, federal recommendations, uh, we will have those uh, that ability to um, to offer that uh, vaccine to our community. Again, we still will ensure that we are focusing on uh, vaccine efforts for those who are still unvaccinated and not fully vaccinated, but we'll be able to um, complement uh, those vaccine efforts with the booster uh, vaccine strategy as well. Okay, the next question is from KUT. What is the likelihood of death among the hospitalized? Do you have a percentage you can share? We are working um, at with the number that one in 100 people that develop COVID-19 will um, pass as a result of this disease entity. And it often happens in those who are um, older and it often happens in those who have comorbidities. Um, and that is why we continue to urge our community to be vaccinated, to uh, protect themselves from um, becoming ill uh, when they're not protected by vaccination, by wearing masks, social distancing, and staying home when sick. Um, we now have 
um, available and widely available and being used now in our community. Um, monoclonal antibody therapy, which has been shown to decrease by 70% hospitalizations in those who are eligible and at risk for more severe disease from COVID-19. So I would urge anyone who is sick to test, um, test early. Um, if you test positive, reach out to a healthcare provider to see if you're eligible for monoclonal antibody therapy. It is free, it doesn't require ID, um, it, it's something that um, will help you get better quickly and it will prevent hospitalizations. And um, we urge all that um, are, are sick to reach out for care early on in the, in the disease process. Don't wait till you're so sick that you have to go to the hospital. All right, thank you. Uh, the last question for this morning is from Community Impact. Has there been any improvement in hospital staffing levels? Are the supplemental staff provided by the state meeting local needs? We continue to have uh, stress in our hospital systems. Um, we still are requesting staff. The people that have been on the front lines working to care for uh, people who are hospitalized from COVID-19, many have been doing so since last March and are understandably fatigued um, from the service that they're providing. However, they still show up every day to work. Um, and we as a community need to do our part to protect our hospital systems by staying home when we're sick getting tested if we're, if we're positive for COVID-19, um, get tested early, get treated if you're eligible with uh, monoclonal antibody therapy, that will reduce hospitalization um, risk rates um, and has been shown to do so. Um, and, and get vaccinated if you're unprotected from um, COVID-19, if you're eligible for vaccine and continue to protect those who are not eligible for vaccination, those under the age of 12, by um, wearing masks and, and protecting them from situations where they can be exposed to COVID-19. Thank you, that concludes the questions from the press. Thank you. At this time, we will now move into our closing remarks, Dr. Walks. I want to ask Austin to continue their efforts to protect our hospital systems by um, going out and getting vaccinated, um, continuing to wear masks, um, staying home when sick, and as I said just a minute ago, um, getting tested if you do feel sick um, so that we can have early detection of COVID-19 and use the treatment that's available in a, to us here in our community of monoclonal antibody therapy for those who are eligible. Um, the, this is the season for the flu, so it's important that we get out there and get, get our flu shots. It's important that we um, protect our loved ones from um, getting not only COVID-19, but the flu. It's important that we protect ourselves and our loved ones by wearing masks when we're out in public so that we do not become sick from COVID-19. We are seeing um, clusters in family groups living together um, who are getting sick, um, some of them waiting for long periods of time before they seek medical care, ending up in hospital. Um, and we've heard stories of families, um, two family members being in ICU on ventilators. Um, we've heard sad stories of people where um, two family members have gotten COVID-19 and one may pass. These, these, deaths, are these deaths are avoidable. Um, these these um, people who are ending up sick, um, almost all um, who are in hospital are unvaccinated. And, and this is, is a sad truth that 
we can prevent by um, encouraging everybody to go out and be vaccinated. Our vaccines are safe. They're readily available. They're available here at APH. They're available at your local pharmacy. There are many vaccine providers in our area. There are vaccine providers who are willing to come to your home to give you your vaccine. Um, if you have questions, ask your health care provider. Go to a trusted source. Don't don't use sources that um, promote things that are unfounded. Um, please get vaccinated. We are reaching that milestone of 70%, but that is not going to deter us from reaching out to each and every person and offering them vaccine. And, and it's not going to stop us from our quest to get our community through and out of this pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Wilkes. Um, I'm thinking back to one of the questions earlier. Uh, was there anything that Austin Public Health could have done better? Of course, um, I think there's always opportunities for improvement and we, we recognize that and I really celebrate and salute the staff for their um, efforts to be as transparent and as vulnerable in their work as possible. Um, at every step possible, we've tried to engage community. We've um, incorporated community feedback um, into many of the improvements that we've made, which is why we're confident in our booster rollout strategy. And when we ever get to the place for vaccines being available for kids, we've heard the concerns and we've made changes and we're going to continue to listen to community. So that's our commitment to you. We are your public health department and we will be here to ensure that every community gets to the 70% mark, uh, whether you're black, brown, east side or west side. Um, and my public health closing statement for today uh, to summarize, flu season is right around the corner. We have two arms, get two shots. COVID flu, keep safe. Thank you. Thanks, and as we've talked about, you know, the grim milestones that we've reached this week related to deaths, and I think there is some hope uh, in our future, and that is we are seeing the number of cases decrease. And, you know, again, if we wanna change the tra trajectory of this pandemic, and have things start coming down again, we need to do and use all those layers of protection that we've discussed today. That's to get vac vaccinated. You know, you've heard about variant diseases. One way to pre prevent and keep those mutations from occurring and taking hold in our community is to make sure we use those layers of protection uh, to keep ourselves and our families uh, safe from a largely preventable disease. So, you know, again, get vaccinated. Uh, it, it's a simple thing to do. It's safe uh, and it will protect you from severe illness and hospitalization and death. Uh, make sure that you are wearing your masks, make sure you're social distancing, make sure you're doing all those things to protect yourself and your family. And with that, I'll turn it over to Cassie. Thank you, Janet. And just to echo everything else, everyone else has said, you know, vaccine is uh, widely available and we know that it is really critical to um, help support our community and to get us um, uh, protected from uh, ongoing transmission of this disease. Um, one thing I do want to note is that we are seeing that First dose vaccine is getting close to 80%. That's a huge, huge, um, uh, great thing for our community. But we are seeing second doses are lagging behind. And so if you're due your second dose, it's time to get it. So make a plan to find a vaccine to, to um, if you had Pfizer, if you have Moderna, find a provider that's providing that. Most providers have both and uh, make sure that you're able to stay on track with getting that second dose and finish the series because you're not fully vaccinated until you've received both vaccines um, and, and have uh, been two weeks out from that second dose. So many of our kids got their first dose vaccine and back to school shots, it's time. If you got vaccinated mid-August, it's time to get your second dose. So we really wanna encourage everybody to 
if you haven't gotten vaccine, seek a vaccine now. If you are needing that second dose, it's time to check your check your cards and see if it's time for your second dose and and uh, seek out a provider to get that vaccine. Um, and with that, just have a great weekend and take care, Austin. Thank you. That concludes our media availability for today. Thank you to Dr. Desmar Walks, Interim APH Director Adrian Stirrup, Chief Epidemiologist Janet Pichette, Cassandra DeLeon, APH Chief Administrative Officer for Disease Prevention Health Promotion Division, and to our poll reporter, Mike Clark Madison from the Austin Chronicle. Thanks for joining us today. Have a safe weekend.